Uh, if you two are finished. <laughs> The next item of business is a debate on motion 15879 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Scottish Rate Resolution. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion for 12 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, the Scottish Parliament votes to set all rates and bans for a Scottish income tax as we use the powers of this Parliament to build a fairer, more prosperous country. This is our opportunity to show our commitment to fund essential public services, to invest in our economy and to care for those most in need. Parliament should also be aware that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work has written to the presiding officer about the procedural connection between the motion for the Scottish Rate Resolution and the Budget eh, Bill. The effect of Rule 9.16.7 of the Standing Orders means that Stage 3 of the Bill cannot begin until the Scottish Rate Resolution motion is agreed by Parliament. So this is an important day. As a Parliament, we will set income tax rates for 1920, forecast to raise over £11.5 billion to support the best outcomes for the people of Scotland. In the Scottish Budget, we have taken responsible decisions to ensure that Scottish income tax is progressive and raises the revenue needed to support essential public services and the economy. It does so in the context of continuing UK austerity and against a backdrop of a UK government careering towards Brexit at any cost, at the cost of our economy, at the cost of free movement of skills and talent, and at the cost of our public finances. And in sharp contrast to the chaos and the uncertainty of the UK government, the Scottish government will keep on delivering good governance for Scotland. Our income tax proposals will continue to follow the four key tests that we introduced in 2017. Our income tax policy will firstly protect the lowest paid taxpayers. Secondly, it will improve progressivity. Thirdly, it will raise additional revenue to maintain and promote Scottish public services. And fourthly, when taken in conjunction with our spending plans, it will support the Scottish economy. The proposals before the Chamber today pass these four tests. And I'm asking the Scottish Parliament today to agree the Scottish Rate Resolution Motion, which for the tax year 2019-20 will raise additional revenue to invest in public services, tackle poverty and support Scotland's economy, and will continue to protect lower and middle earning taxpayers, making the system fairer and more progressive. Happily. James Kelly. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. On the issue of tackling poverty, do you think the tax proposals that you're putting before Parliament are fair in that 99% of taxpayers will pay less tax while there are 230,000 children in the country living in poverty? Kate Forbes. Thank the member for that um, question. And as the member will know, our um, tax policies today will raise an extra £68 million to invest in public services and critically to tackle poverty when you look at it in conjunction with the various budget um, spending plans. My question to Labour is what their tax policy is this week. What would Labour's mysterious tax policy have raised in order to deal with the critical issues that this country faces? Because a cornerstone of the Scottish approach to taxation is certainty. And in 1920, that is why we will not raise any of the rates of income tax. But we will, importantly, increase the starter and basic rate bans by inflation to protect the lowest and middle earning taxpayers. Yep. Elaine Smith. The, the Minister for taking an intervention, but perhaps the Minister could tell us then why SNP manifesto after manifesto actually did support reinstating the 50 pence top rate of tax, but now in this parliament, the SNP do not. Kate Forbes. We base all our decisions on evidence to ensure that we have that certainty of public revenue in order to deal with the public spending plans that we have yeah. to deal with the critical issues of poverty. We require that certainty of revenue because creating, inventing tax rates out of, out of the sky is not going to guarantee mm. that guaranteed yeah. revenue. And again, Labour have had several months to come forward to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance with their proposals and with their spending plans that have been actually costed and they have failed to do so. So in sharp contrast to that, 
our government's policies will ensure that there is the public revenue to back up our public spending plans and our tax policies will ensure that 55% of Scottish taxpayers continue to pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. Now is not the time to pass on the UK government's tax cuts for the highest earners. Under our proposals, the higher rate threshold will remain frozen at 43,430 in 1920, a decision that the Scottish Fiscal Commission have forecast will raise an additional £68 million for the Scottish budget next year compared to an inflationary <coughs> increase. And I hear the scintillating tones of another member. M Mike Rumbles. Which would take in the intervention. Would you call it progressive for the state to take more than half of people's income who earn more than 43,000? Is it progressive to take more than half the state? Kate Forbes. Well, I don't think it's progressive. And that is that the Liberal Democrats are now piping up in a debate when they have had months to meaningfully engage, negotiate, and maybe, just maybe, shape the budget. Yeah, and it is a classic example yeah. of all talk in this chamber yeah. and absolutely no action to deliver their policies. The decisions... The decisions on tax that we have taken have enabled us to mitigate the, the decade-long bite of austerity that's been inflicted by the UK government on our resource budget and to continue to invest in our public services, in our people and in our businesses. Since the Scottish Parliament acquired powers over income tax, this government has been clear in its ambition that income tax revenues should support the delivery of vital public services and enable investment in the economy. And overall, the Scottish Government's progressive approach to taxation will deliver the additional revenue next year to support a budget that will protect our public services that are free at the point of use, increase spending on health and care services by nearly three quarters of a billion pounds, provide local government with a real terms increase in revenue and capital spending, and provide over five billion pounds of capital investment to grow and to modernise Scotland's infrastructure. And I'm also proud that as a government, we are transforming the social security landscape in Scotland with the creation of a compassionate and a just Scottish social security system with dignity, with fairness and with respect at its heart. I'm confident that the income tax proposals we have put before Parliament will deliver the best outcomes for the people and the economy of Scotland. Tax powers are not a political toy. They have an impact on individuals and on the economy. The decisions that this government have made have to be seen in the context of the UK government's continued pursuit of budget cuts. Scotland's discretionary resource budget allocation will be £1.9 billion lower in real terms in 1920 than it was in 2010-2011. That is a fall of 6.5%. It puts a huge strain on public spending, which this budget works hard to manage. And a key principle, born of Adam Smith, is that taxes should be proportionate to the ability to pay. In the present context, that means that we must ensure that those least able to pay are not shouldering the burden of austerity. Now, some in this chamber are desperate to claim our tax policy is a major risk to Scotland's economy, despite the fact that even under the most pessimistic assumptions, our income tax policies would still raise additional revenues and our economy continues to grow. Interestingly, those same members are sitting idly by as their party at Westminster presides over the shambles of Brexit, which all business organisations um, identify as the greatest threat to the Scottish economy. Unlike them, we want our decisions to be based always on the best evidence. The Cabinet Secretary has asked our Council of Economic Advisers to expand, expand their analysis of the impact of potential behavioural effects of tax policy changes and the possible impact on future revenues. I look forward to seeing their advice, which will, as always, form an important part of future budget decisions on income tax. The delivery of Scottish income tax has been a major achievement. However, as Westminster still retains control over key elements of income tax and the administration of Scottish income tax, we continue to work closely with HMRC to ensure that the devolved and reserved aspects of income tax work as smoothly as possible. The status quo is not perfect and we continue to be limited in our ability to use this tool to best effect while the administration of income tax 
national insurance and income tax on dividends and savings remains within the UK government. Notwithstanding these limitations, as income tax receipts now account for around 30% of Scottish government revenues, we continue to invest in the Scottish economy and its workforce to improve the prospects of economic and employment growth. The Scottish economy, the powerhouse that fuels ambition for Scotland, has seen positive growth in all seven quarters since the start of 2017, and our annual growth rate remains at 1.5% in line with the UK rate, and unemployment in Scotland is at a record low, as stats out today prove once again. Furthermore, since 2007, Scotland's productivity growth has been faster than all other countries and regions of the UK, including London and South East England. Our ongoing investment in the economy comes at a time when Scotland's economic performance has remained resilient despite heightened economic uncertainty as the UK government recklessly moves closer to crashing out of the EU. And against this backdrop, our income tax proposals start from a strong base. Since we introduced our fairer tax system, our economy has still grown, grown in line with the UK, demonstrating that those who predicted our tax policy would hit the economy are wrong. Future revenues for the Scottish Government will be driven both by our policy choices and by the relative growth per capita in our tax receipts. The Scottish Fiscal Commission published its latest set of independent economic and fiscal forecasts for Scotland on the 12th of December, where forecasts of GDP growth were revised upwards in every year. They expect the Scottish economy to grow 1.2% in 2019, 1% in 2020 and 2021, 1.1% in 2022, and 1.2% in 2023. But we will do everything in our power to exceed those forecasts. However, the Commission makes clear that Brexit is a key factor that is expected to lead to slower growth in productivity, population and trade in future years. So, Presiding Officer, at a time of constrained growth, prolonged austerity and growing economic uncertainty, all exacerbated by this current UK Government, we are proposing to protect the lowest earning taxpayers, deliver a progressive tax system and raise additional revenue to support vital public services. And I move the motion in the name of Derek Mackay. I call Murdo Fraser. Eight minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding uh, Officer. Well, after all that money that the uh, Finance Secretary spent on improving his speaking skill, I'm so disappointed he didn't get a chance to show it off in the debate uh, this afternoon, but hopefully we'll be returning to that on Thursday afternoon, uh, Finance Secretary. Uh, but today the Scottish Conservatives will be opposing the Scottish Rate Resolution. And we do so because we do not believe it is fair to burden hardworking Scots with yet more taxes, to widen the income tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And we will, in this debate, be highlighting the SNP's broken promises to the Scottish people. But first of all, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think it's worth setting in context the decisions that the Finance Secretary has had to make around taxation. The block grant from Westminster is increasing in real terms from 2019-20 by some £521 million, according to Spice. And that means, despite all the rhetoric we hear from the SNP benches about Westminster cuts, the Scottish Government has more money to spend in the coming year than in this one. Indeed, if we look at the Scottish Government's entire budget, it is up in real terms compared to when the Conservatives first came to power in Westminster in 2010. And we should remember what the SNP promised the voters of Scotland at the last election. The SNP manifesto in 2016 said this, we will freeze the basic rate of income tax throughout the next parliament to protect those on low and middle incomes. Nicola Sturgeon herself said in this parliament on the 2nd of February 2016. I have been very clear that this government will not increase income tax rates. Well, presiding officer, it didn't take long for that promise to be broken. Yes, I'll go away. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member very much for giving way. Would the member accept that manifestos are dependent on having a majority government and minority parties always have to negotiate the position? Marjorie Fraser. Well, I'll say to Mr Mason, the Conservatives would have been delighted to have sat down with the SNP government and delivered a tax policy for Scotland that was about growing the economy and growing tax revenues. 
but they're more interested in talking to their friends in the Green Party than they were in having constructive discussion with us. But who knows? There's always next year, Mr. Mason. We live in hope. <laughs> Presiding officer, it didn't take long for these promises that were made to be broken. In last year's budget, we saw higher taxes in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK for some 45% of the Scottish population, breaking that manifesto pledge. And in the right resolution we see today, the SNP are going even further. Thanks to these tax changes, everyone in Scotland earning over £26,990 a year will pay more in tax than they will pay in the rest of the UK. And that is not the rich presiding officer. These are not the wealthy people in society. These are ordinary, hard-working families, some with a household income of just £27,000 who are being penalised by the SNP. And in practical terms, this means that a police sergeant earning just over £45,000 will be nearly £700 a year worse off than their counterparts south of the border, and a principal teacher earning £51,330 more than £1,500 a year worse off. So it's little wonder that we have heard concerns raised by those in business about the impact of these tax changes. The CBI in Scotland have warned that the divergence in income tax will be a major issue for companies keen to attract the best talent. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce have warned that it could take years to repair the damage of higher taxes. The Scottish Life Sciences Association told the First Minister in March last year that it had strong concerns about the tax increases which would damage the recruitment of highly skilled people. And after stage one of the budget process just three weeks ago, the Federation of Small Business said that the Finance Secretary's budget changes would, and I quote, erode the small business community's trust. And that there will be behaviour change as a result of these tax increases is beyond doubt. The Scottish Fiscal Commission have predicted that Scotland will lose approximately £34 million over the next five years because people will be encouraged to leave Scotland or not come here to begin with. And that may well prove to be an underestimate if the tax gap continues to grow. Just today, we've seen the Chartered Institute of Taxation warn that the 15% of all Scottish taxpayers who contribute almost 60% of entire total revenues could take legitimate steps to limit their tax liabilities, for example, by working fewer hours or by putting more money into pension payments rather than taking that as salary, with a detrimental impact both on the Scottish economy and on overall tax revenues. Now, the saving of £20 uh, pounds a year that we've seen for the lowest paid uh, pales into insignificance against the potential additional costs that we're seeing from other tax changes in this budget. Because while we're talking today about the rate resolution, we have to put this in the context of the wider tax changes uh, that we are also seeing. So increasing the council tax cap from 3% to 4.78%, Another broken manifesto promise from the SNP will also hit lower income families in the pocket. But worse than that, we have the new car park tax, the workplace parking levy, levy that could cost up to £500 a year, a regressive tax, one that's not based on the ability to pay and one that will hit the lowest earnest the hardest. And in, in, in moving, the, I'll give away in a second, in moving this debate, the minister uh, made uh, the point that the tax changes being announced today will protect the lowest paid. But those who will suffer the most from a £500 a year flat charge will be the lowest paid, many of whom have no option but to use cars as a means of getting to work. I'll give way to Mr Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to Murdo Fraser for giving way. Twice now he's used a specific figure uh, as to what the, the, car, the, the, the uh, workplace parking levy Will, uh, will actually uh, cost people. Presumably then he's aware of some Scottish local authorities have developed specific proposals and are, are, are setting out what their levy would be. Can he name those local authorities or does he just want to tie the hands of all of them to forbid them from even, even considering whether they might use this policy at all? Murdo Fraser. The reason we're using that figure of £500, and Mr Harvey knows perfectly well, is that the only existing model that exists in the United Kingdom for this is in Nottingham, where the charge is £410 or £419 a year, to which must be added VAT if it's charged out by employers to employees. Now, if Mr Harvey wants to come forward with a suite of alternatives, we'll be very happy to debate that with him, and I'm sure local government will want to do too. 
Well, I think it's reasonable to proceed on the assumption that that is the sort of level likely to be imposed here. And we, of course, already know we have SNP-run councils, for example, here in Edinburgh, who are already enthusiastically talking about this charge. And the SNP leader of Edinburgh Council already saying he wants to see that charge not paid by employers, but the paid by employees. The very employees, the very low-paid employees, this government says it wants to protect, facing a flat charge of £500 a year, a regressive flat rate tax, presiding officer. Now, presiding officer, we know that the Scottish economy has been underperforming that of the UK as a whole. The Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecasts show this situation will continue in each of the next four years. And we see the impact of that in the income tax projections from the Fiscal Commission, a £500 million black hole Please at the come heart to of the Scottish Government's income projections for the current year. Now, these forecasts may prove to be incorrect, but if they're not, in two years' time there's a large gap to be filled. Besides, I could go on at great length let me just reiterate the point. This resolution today breaks manifesto promises for the S from the SNP, and for that reason, this chamber should reject it. James Kelly, seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour will oppose the rate resolution before Parliament today. Uh, we don't favour giving tax cuts to chief executives while penalising councils and asking them to make service cuts. It's simply unfair that high earners on six-figure salaries will pay less tax while councils face the prospect of having to make workers redundant. Against the background of which the, the government has brought the rate <coughs> resolution forward, uh, has to be set the Fiscal Commission forecasts uh, for 1920, which show uh, income tax forecasts down by a billion pounds. Once that is fed into the block grant adjustment, that could mean £500 million uh, less money. The main driver for that is the number of the, the less number of uh, additional, sorry, higher in top rate payers, uh, which was, came as a result of the HMRC outturn report. That's not anything that the can be, that, that, that's not a fault of the government. However, the government needs to take account of these circumstances in terms of taking t uh, setting tax policy, particularly when assessed against the situation in the country, because we continue to see uh, big issues around poverty and inequality. There are 230,000 children in Scotland living in po poverty. Many wards uh, in the country, including in the Cabinet Secretary's constituency, uh, have poverty rates uh, running at 30%. And that's why uh, charities and third sector groups uh, favoured the raising of child benefit by five pounds, something that was also um, given some support recently by Kevin Pringle, someone who is obviously respected on the SNP benches. I think the other factor that needs to be taken into account is the public service cuts that we're starting to see as councils begin to set their budget. We saw uh, workers in Dundee demonstrating on the streets uh, at the weekend, uh, and that's because the council are looking at proposals in education alone to cut school budgets uh, by 3%, which could re result in a reduction of 26 teaching posts. Uh, it doesn't say much for the government's commitment around education. In Aberdeenshire, um, there, are, there are proposed cuts to uh, schools and libraries with a potential loss of 150 uh, positions. And in Clackmannanshire, the, the support to the Citizens Advice Bureau uh, faces the threat of being cut altogether. Against that backdrop, uh, the tax policy brought forward from the, the SNP government is simply uh, unfair. Sure. Kate Forbes. Uh, I thank the member for taking intervention. In order to fund all these additional asks, by how much would the higher rate um, tax rate have to be increased by to fund those? James Kelly. Specifically what the SNP government should be doing is they should be charging top rate payers uh, 50 pence. In addition to that, in, in, the, in the higher rate band of between 43,430 to 150,000, that band is too wide and there should be some additional tax raised in that band, which would raise significant amounts of money, which would mitigate the council cuts 
that have been outlining in addition to tackling uh, child, uh, child poverty. The reality is, the reality is the SNP government have made a choice here. They made a choice to introduce a tax cuts budget that will favour 99% of taxpayers, but at the same time continuing to penalise local councils and lacking the, lacking the, but just a wee minute, lacking the ambition uh, to tackle child poverty. I'll give way to Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, Mr Kelly knows that a, a large bulk of the the cuts that he's talking, the tax cuts that he's talking about, result from changes to the personal allowance, a UK change. Can he remind us how Labour voted on that, and did they argue against that change to the personal allowance, or did they vote for it in just the same way as they voted for the cuts at the higher rate? James Kelly. We made our position in Scotland absolutely clear in relation to that, as we'll make our position clear in voting against a tax policy this evening that, that lacks ambition. You know, there's been a lot of commentary and coverage about uh, coming up for the 20-year anniversary of devolution. If you had to go back to 1999 and you said to someone, see in 20 years' time, the, the Scottish Parliament are going to be setting a tax rate that is going to result in tax cuts for bankers in Bears Den, lawyers in Lossiemouth, or chartered accountants uh, in Carnoustie. But at the same time, if you're a pool attendant in a local leisure centre, the leisure centre might not only be closing, you might be out of a job. People wouldn't have believed that. They would have said, the Tories must, must be in power then. But this is coming forward from a supposed, a supposed progressive uh, SNP government. It's simply uh, not good enough. And the reality is also that uh, these cuts... Uh, passing on austerity will also uh, uh, blunt economic growth. We saw from analysis published yesterday that there's been 417 million cuts to university education. We need to invest in education, we need to invest uh, in universities if we're going to produce the appropriate graduates with skills that are going to make a contribution to grow the Scottish eco economy. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm running out of time. So, in summing up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Labour won't support a re rate resolution that puts more money in the pockets of higher re re earners and poses a threat of P45s to council workers. We need a plan that positively uses the powers of devolution to stop the cuts and to ta tackle child poverty. The plan being put forward by the SNP government, it lacks ambition and misses a chance to help many people and communities in the country and it should be rejected. Patrick Harvey, six minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I uh, rise with mixed feelings because I see a rate resolution which, while it is certainly not perfect, uh, is a great deal better than I think uh, James Kelly, for example, gave it credit for. What we're seeing is not a rate resolution which itself includes cuts for the high earners. Those cuts for high earners are the result of UK policies. What we are seeing is a rate resolution which could do better. In uh, 2016, the Greens were the only party in that election to put forward creative proposals for the use of new devolved income tax powers, not refusing to act, but also not hiking tax for low earners, uh, finding ways to, to show that it's possible to raise revenue while cutting inequality at the same time. It did take us another year and a half or so after that election of consistently making the case before the Scottish Government accepted that this is what should be done. And the shift last year to a five-band system absolutely was the right move. And it's underpinned by the right priorities as well, the goals of raising revenue, protecting low earners, cutting inequality, uh, and, and so on. So I, I, I'm pleased to, to see that that has been implemented last year. And I'm pleased to see uh, that it's proved to be more popular than I think the Scottish Government thought it might be. Uh, in fact, I was even pleased to see uh, that the Scottish Government picked up a, a gong at the Public Service Awards late last year for innovation, for the way that they developed 
uh, this new policy with rigorous analysis, with open participative uh, public engagement and civic engagement. Uh, that's the way that we should do these things. And it, yes, indeed. Elaine Smith. Thank Patrick Harvey for taking an intervention, but I would like to ask him if he's pleased to see 230 million of cuts to local government. Patrick Harvey. I am pleased that we have done what we could to uh, prevent cuts to local government, and I only wish, I only wish that every political party in this place was putting forward positive, well worked up, costed proposals and seeking improvements to the Scottish budget. And I think if we all did that, the, the, the result would be better than we've managed to achieve on our own. Look, the, that open, I'm sorry, I do need to, to move on. That, that open, participative approach uh, to, to setting tax policy contrasts with the shallow rhetoric that we of, often hear from the Conservatives who want to portray uh, Scotland as the highest tax part of the UK. Uh, and sometimes Derek Mackay has replied by saying we're the lowest tax part of the UK. The reality is we're both. We're the lowest tax part of the UK for low earners and the highest taxed part for high earners, and that is as it should be. And if Murdo wa Fraser wants to intervene at that point, I'd be happy to let him in. Murdo Fraser. Uh, uh, the debate had moved along a little bit from the point I was going to make, but let me, let me just ask, ask that if I can. When Mr Harvey negotiated the extra £90 million for local uh, government, was he aware there was another £54 million he could have had that Mr Mackay was keeping quiet about? Patrick Harvey. We've had this uh, out at the Finance Committee. I, I don't think anything has been kept quiet about, but the, the very clear commitment to fund the teacher pay settlement is something that I believe uh, that the Scottish uh, Conservatives even ought to welcome. They know that we need uh, the, that pay settlement to attract the teachers that we need. Look, it is, it is regrettable that after the progress that we made last year, the Scottish Government still resists the case for building on that progress and going further, especially in the context of that UK change that I mentioned to, to James Kelly, the, the uplift in the personal allowance. And once again, there are always still people who say we've lifted more people out of taxation altogether by raising the personal allowance. The personal allowance increases that we've seen are not a progressive measure. The bulk of what that policy costs goes to high income households high-income households, and achieves nothing at all for the lowest earners, because the lowest earners, of course, are already below where the threshold was. So those increases in the personal allowance uh, are not positive. And it would have been possible for the Scottish Government to recoup that, not from everybody, but from high earners, so that we don't see that tax cut benefiting those who need it the least, uh, if it's very brief. Mike Rumbles. Good question. Could you make it clear? Are you voting for this uh, this evening or are you abstaining? Patrick Harvey. We, we've made it clear already when we reached an agreement with the, the Scottish Government on the budget that we would abstain on the rate resolution because we don't believe that it goes far enough. But we're not willing to put at risk the wider achievements that we've made uh, on amendments to the budget, which, which would fall if this rate resolution falls. Look, the, the tax gap that the Conservatives are concerned about uh, and the, uh, the, the tax cuts at the top end that the Labour Party are concerned about and that I oppose as well are the result of UK policies, as indeed is the national insurance anomaly. National insurance is not a progressive uh, means of, of funding uh, public services or the, or the social security system. Uh, its tax base is income, but its tax rate goes down when income goes up. It's an absurd uh, notion and the idea that there will be no anomalies when that regressive uh, system of national insurance remains reserved but a progressive approach to income tax is devolved. The idea that there will be no anomalies is not achievable. We have a, a more progressive approach in Scotland. I wish the Scottish Government was going further to build on that, to boost the budget further and further in a, a decrease in equality. But I will abstain to allow this rate resolution to go through and I'll continue to make the case for a wider context of creative, innovative approaches to taxation on wealth as well as income, on consumption as well as production and at national as well as local level. All of these are needed. Willie Rennie, six minutes please. Uh, thank you Deputy President Officer. I read uh, this morning in my Dundee Courier that Patrick Harvey is really angry. Angry that the SNP government isn't putting tax up enough. 
I would have thought this level of anger and the concern that's just been expressed would have led Patrick Harvey to vote against the rate resolution today. But no, as we've just heard, he's going to oppose it by abstaining at five o'clock this evening. So as his budget letter, as he's just outlined to Derek Mackay makes clear, this will allow the SNP to win the vote this evening. So the Greens are so angry, they will oppose it by letting the SNP win. It's curious because, because last year, this tax package was devised by the Greens. Now they have reflected, they're angry about it. So if the people who invented the tax system are not even going to vote for it, I'm not surprised that anybody else in the chamber is going to vote for it either. Back in, no, not just now. Back in 2016, the Liberal Democrats were the first to advocate the use of the new income tax powers gained by the Scottish Parliament under the Cowman Commission powers. Powers that we drew up in the Steel Commission and the Campbell Commission, and the powers that we are determined to use responsibly. We said a modest tax rise could secure a significant financial investment for education without resulting in adverse behavioural change. We were never in favour of ramping up tax at every budget and at every opportunity. It was about the balance. Everyone knows the SNP broke their 2016 election manifesto commitment on income tax. They said there would be no rise for basic rate taxpayers. What they did then was rebrand a lot of the basic rate taxpayers as something else then stuck up their tax. It was dishonest. The SNP told taxpayers there would be no tax increase before putting up the tax. But thankfully, the SNP's 2016 manifesto was wrong. It is early days, but there does seem to be no evidence that I am aware of that the tax increase has driven taxpayers out of the country. However, it is a delicate balance. Sometimes it's about perception and future intentions. If taxpayers believe that tax increases will come with every budget, then we may see adverse behavioural change. So it should be treated with care. But so far, with this budget, this government has been careless. This budget agreement has five separate tax rises. There is a freeze in the higher rate tax threshold. The council tax increase above the 3% promised by the SNP in their manifesto, which is another broken promise. The plastic bag tax increase, which it breaks the important link between charities and the charge and puts some of the money into councils. The tourism tax and, of course, the workplace car parking levy. A last-minute, poorly prepared amendment to the transport bill. Irrespective of the merits of these individual changes, the overall impression is one of a government that is ramping up tax in a wide range of areas and at every budget. All five of these increases were not in the SNP manifesto. Many of them weren't even in the Green manifesto. The government is making it up as they go along, without a mandate for change and with a tax agenda that is apparently unstoppable. Yes. Derek Mackay. Most of those uh, subject areas that Willie Rennie has just mentioned are actually powers that local Liberal Democrats are asking me for through local government. So is Willie oh. Rennie saying that oh. Liberal Democrats are wrong and local government to be asking, not necessarily for tax rises, but for the powers through localism that the government is proposing? Oh. Willie Rennie. I, I do not support giving local government a bunch of taxes that don't raise the money that's necessary and calling it local government finance reform. It is a con and it is disrespecting councils. It is not proper local government finance reform. So therefore, I would urge the government to be very delicate and careful with their proposals. This is bad news. It's bad news for those of us who support modest progressive tax changes that deliver a benefit to public services. It's bad news as some of those taxes will not work. They will not deliver the investment we need for public services and they will give progressive governments a bad name. And flaws in this approach cannot be hidden by the fig leaf of local government finance reform. Handing councils a bunch of taxes that won't work and won't raise the funds that councils need is certainly not reform. It's another example of this government treating councils with the disrespect that has come the norm for this government. We must win the argument that modest, progressive tax changes can work. I want to give confidence that those progressive, modest change is possible and it is good for public services. This budget does not help with that mission. We will oppose it 
today. We will oppose the rate resolution. If the Greens are really angry, they will join us as well. But as ever, as ever, it is all about independence, keeping the independence majority together, no matter what the damage, no matter what the damage is to progressive politics, these two will always be together. Thank you. We'll move on to the open debate. Uh, time is really tight, so speeches of under six minutes, please, to avoid penalising members towards the end. And um, just before I leave the chair, can I remind all members that they should always speak through the chair, even in interventions. Thank you. And I now call John Mason to be followed by Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I do welcome this resolution as a continuing effort to move to a more progressive and fairer income tax system, and hopefully eventually to a fairer overall tax system. Clearly, our focus today is on income tax, but this is not a devolved tax, and we have very limited or no control over many aspects of it. I think many of us would agree that income tax is one of the fairest taxes, as it is linked to income, and those who are earning more rightly pay more. Property taxes like council tax or rates, and sales taxes or VAT, are also necessary and have their place. However, criticism of them is that they do not take account of ability to pay, at least ability based on income, whereas income tax does take ability to pay into account. Now, the UK income tax system is overly complex and has many weaknesses. And one of the main criticisms is that we actually have two income taxes, as Patrick Harvey touched on, namely income tax itself and also national insurance. National insurance is particularly unfair as it is regressive, with a starting rate of 12%, but reducing to 2% for those on higher incomes. So someone on 20% income tax and 12% national insurance pays 32% on a fairly low income, while at the upper end, 46% is the top, plus 2% national insurance, giving a total of 48%. So the combined, if you combine the two, the range is from 32% at the bottom to 48% at the top, which is far, far too narrow in my opinion. It has been repeatedly suggested to Westminster governments that it would be both fairer and much simpler if income tax and national insurance were to be combined. However, they have repeatedly refused to do that. Perhaps that is because the media focus tends to be on income tax and not on national insurance. So if the two were combined, taxpayers throughout the UK would see much more clearly what an unfair and regressive system the UK currently has. Frankly, I would rather we had a combined rate of tax and national insurance starting at perhaps 10% and going up in steps to perhaps 60%. I realise I've argued this before and I will continue to do so because it's a reminder that any Scottish government of any party is having to build on a very second rate UK income tax system. So our first problem is a flawed UK system. I mean, to suggest that the second major problem we face today is that the Parliament has control or influence over only a very limited range of taxes. The UK controls corporation tax, VAT, inheritance tax, to name but three. If we were able, as a free country, to use a whole basket of taxes, then there might be less emphasis on the rates of income tax, and we would be able to put more of the burden onto those who are very wealthy. The main reason we are only to be assigned a share of VAT in due course, rather than being allowed control over it, has been that the EU does not allow VAT variations within a state. However, if we are to leave the EU, and I am totally opposed to that, then it does appear to be possible for VAT to be devolved. Clearly, we would have to look at each of these taxes individually and consider how best to use them if they were devolved. But it does seem clear that Ireland has used variations of corporation tax to its advantage, and even states in the US can and do vary sales taxes. Now, I understand that the Conservatives are arguing that income tax in Scotland is too high and we should be cutting tax while also cutting expenditure. So the Tories are arguing, let's be clear, that they want to cut schools, they want to cut hospitals, and they want to cut local government. Now, that is fair enough. They're entitled to that position, but I am certainly glad that a majority in this parliament disagree. On the other hand, I think the Greens and possibly Labour would feel that income tax is not high enough or progressive enough. And my sympathies are certainly more towards them than towards the Conservatives. Uh, absolutely. 
Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the member for taking an intervention. But if we come back to the powers we do actually have, I wonder what the member's opinion is that those earning just over 43,000 are paying the same levels of income tax as those earning up to three times that amount. John Mason. Well, I think I've tried to explain already. I'd like to see a more uh, progressive uh, system right across the board. Uh, however, I think I'm just going to go on to this now about the comparisons with England, and we do have to be just a little bit careful about that. Frankly, I do not like constant comparisons with neighbours down south. It is not healthy for an individual or a family or a country to be constantly comparing with the folk next door. We know the pressure children in particular can put on parents because we want the same clothing brands or the same IT products as their school peers. As a country, I believe we have to look at our income and expenditure and decide what is right for us without being fixated so much about what England is doing. However, at the same time, I accept that we are in bed with an elephant and we have to tread carefully with tax like income tax, where residents can be changed fairly readily and the last thing we want to do is lose taxpayers from Scotland and subsequently lose all of their tax to the rest of the UK or anywhere else. Therefore, I think this grad... I don't think I've time, The sorry. member's just concluding. He's only got six minutes. Therefore, I think this gradual move to differentiate our tax rates and, in fact, our whole tax system is the right approach. We do not yet know in the longer term how many people will choose to be in Scotland because there are higher taxes and better public services, or on the other hand, how many people will want to go to a low tax, low service regime as England aspires to. Therefore, in conclusion, I certainly support the motion today. As I've tried to argue, we're dealing with a very flawed UK system and a flawed UK tax system. But we are here where we are, and I support this plan for Scotland, which makes us a bit more progressive and a bit more fair than we have been. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Ian Gray. Mr Bowman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As the third chartered accountant to speak in this debate, I hope everybody is still managing to keep awake. Um, today, the, today the SNP seek this Chamber's agreement to the proposed rates and bans for Scottish income tax. The income tax proposal today will punish hard workers, raise taxes and damage Scotland's overall economic growth. As been, has been said in the Chamber before, the SNP and its endeavour to deliver these promises, these policies, has broken its promises to the Scottish people. Derek Mackay has forced more tax rises on Scotland against the wishes of almost two thirds of Scots who voted for parties that promised not to raise taxes in the Scottish Parliament election. Two years in, the only thing Mr Mackay has stayed true to is his willingness to use the ever-eager Greens to push through his budget. Like with the poorly conceived car, tax, car park tax, on which he has admittedly done no economic analysis and has the audacity to propose fining businesses pounds for every day that they do not fully comply with the rules on declaring car parking spaces. Hard-working Scots and businesses are rightly appalled by this and dissent amongst his own supporters should tell him what a disaster this tax is going to be. Irrespective of the SNP and Greens' grubby deal, the SNP's budget was increasing by £521 million in real terms in 2019-2020, thanks to the Conservatives and the UK government. Here, here. The block grant from the UK government will rise by 1.7% in real terms next year and the Scottish Government's budget will increase by £1.1 billion, £1 .1 billion pounds in cash terms in 2019-2020. This is on top of the increase to the tax-free personal allowance, £12,500, and means that spending cuts and tax rises proposed today are Mr Mackay's choices, not a necessity. And these decisions have real-time consequences. We are talking about Scotland's fiscal deficit under the SNP being three and a half times the size of the UK deficit and nearly double any other EU country. We are talking about the gap between the UK and Scotland deficits as a percentage of GDP being the largest since GERS records began in 1998-1999. And we are talking about the erosion of trust between the Scottish Government and ordinary Scots. Since 2010, the, Scottish, the Conservative UK government has cut taxes for Scots on the basic rate by over £1,000 and increased the tax-free personal allowance. If it's a quick look. Tom Arthur. Very grateful to Mr Bowman for giving way. I wonder if you could clarify a point for me. Is it Scottish Conservative Party policy that income tax rates in Scotland should not be a penny higher than they are in the rest of the UK? 
and the income tax rate threshold should not be a penny lower than they are in the rest of the UK. Bill Bowman. I think what we say is that the taxation here should be competitive with the rest of the UK. In response to this decision, the SNP has broken a 2016 election promise and has raised taxes on anyone earning over £26,990, who will now pay more in tax than they would in the rest of the UK. Is the decision to put those on low and middle incomes and Scotland's larger economy at risk through this budget a responsible thing to do? The Scottish economy is suffering under a decade of SNP mismanagement and, co and incompetence, which has, according to, for example, the Scottish Retail Consortium, produced the worst real-term December sales figures in 20 years. I'm, I've had an intervention. I don't have time. Calls have been made for the SNP to cut business rates, support business improvement districts across Scotland, free up planning restrictions in town centres, and increase the use of public procurement to support the local economy. Firms across my own area of Dundee and the wider North East know the frustration of watching this government work all too well. And incidents such as the administration of McGill's and the closure of Michelin production are becoming more frequent in response to the SNP's failings. Moreover, increased public spending and higher economic growth in Scotland has been helped as a result of a significantly higher block grant. Will this harmful record and the damage it is doing to our wider economic productivity, mind, I want to repeat that the spending cuts and tax rises proposed today are Derek Mackay's choice, not a necessity. The SNP's damaging tax proposals have been condemned by respected bodies, including the Federation of Small Businesses, the Scottish Life Sciences Association, the Scottish Retail Consortium, CBI Scotland, and the Chartered Institute of Taxation, who argue that income tax could become a major adverse issue for companies keen to attract the best talent and that income tax rises proposed by the SNP mean that anyone earning over 26,990 will pay more than they would in the rest of the UK. And those paying the top rates will rearrange legitimately their affairs so the tax paid in Scotland reduces. The saddest aspect of all of this is that the attack on Scottish income tax is being exacted willingly, inflicting economic hardship on Scottish workers and risking the Scottish economy as a political choice by Derek Mackay and the SNP. While the SNP and the Greens might be content to view hardworking Scots as a golden goose, on these benches we stand up for public services, we stand up for hard-pressed Scots and their families, we stand up for fair taxation, and we stand up for supporting Scotland's economy. The SNP have promised much, but failed to deliver on the economy for more than a decade. It is time they were held to account, and they will be for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowman. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr. Gray, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. This uh, really should be a, a debate of substance, an annual debate of substance. It is, after all, in many ways, a symbol of the maturing uh, of her parliament. This is the 20th anniversary uh, of the formation of this parliament, formed, of course, following a referendum, a referendum which uh, uh, uniquely in the referendums in my lifetime, brought the country together rather than uh, split it apart. Uh, I, I think James Kelly is correct, brought the country together in the belief that it is a parliament who would strive uh, to make Scotland fairer, not less fair. Uh, but a referendum where the people of Scotland even voted that the parliament should have uh, taxation powers, although, as we all know, uh, the powers as originally introduced were flawed, and therefore never used. A correction, first in the Kalman Commission and then later uh, through the work of the Smith Commission, six weeks uh, of my life uh, and some others here's lives too, uh, that, that we will never get back again. Much of which was spent exactly trying to thrash out uh, a, a, a scheme uh, of devolution of tax and in particular income tax, uh, which maintained the balance between that uh, and the capacity to pool and share resources across the United Kingdom as well uh, through the Barnett formula. So it was a difficult negotiation that left this parliament far more powerful than it had previously been, and the debate should reflect that. But sadly, it's a debate that's rather constrained for the reasons that John Mason alluded to, because the loudest voices uh, in uh, this debate today and in the run-up today have rather been the Tories uh, who uh, seem 
offended by any difference in taxation here in Scotland compared to the rest of the United Kingdom, although uh, it does make me wonder what they were arguing for uh, through those weeks uh, in the Smith Commission, uh, or indeed uh, the SNP, uh, who uh, also uh, seemed determined to compare uh, their tax plans with the rest of the United Kingdom, although on occasion they argue that they are taxing more in order to appear progressive, and on other occasions they argue they're taxing less uh, in order, I suppose, to appear uh, more popular. But in each case, uh, everything is seen through the prism of that comparison, as John Mason uh, said, uh, with the neighbours. But that's not what this should de debate should be about. It should be about the tax we need to raise and how we raise it for the responsibilities that we have. It should be about our capacity to respond to our citizens' needs uh, and the breadth of our vision to invest in our nation's futures. To be fair, uh, I think Patrick Harvey and the Greens uh, do get that. And indeed, uh, uh, when I look at the press release that they put out earlier today, it seems very clear to me that they believe that the plans which have been brought forward uh, to us this evening fall well short of that. They warn the Scottish Government that it can't afford to keep stalling on action to reduce inequality and to protect public services. They complain that we have a government reluctant to anger right-wing voices by going further uh, on income tax. What puzzles me then is why, when it comes to this evening's vote, they intend to exercise all the political pragmatism of Pontius Pilate by simply abstaining and allowing this tax plan they object to, to move through. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to Ian Gray for giving way, and I, I hope he heard in my speech a recognition that this is not perfection, but surely, surely the kind of maturity from a parliament that he's asking for would involve all political parties putting forward positive suggestions for change, trying to actually achieve something different in Scottish budgets. That's what we've done, and I think the parliament would be a lot better if every other party did so as well. I'll give you your time back, Mr Gray. You were anxious. Perhaps. Perhaps uh, Mr Harvey uh, should reflect on the fact that the budget itself might be better if he was willing with us to exercise the leverage which a different vote this evening would give us. And perhaps we could do more to address those cuts, those cuts to public services and the other issues which many have brought up. No, I, I don't have time. So the question has to be for us, do these tax plans provide, uh, provide us uh, with the support we need for the vulnerable. And they clearly don't. One in four of our children live in poverty. So how can it be right that for anyone earning up to £124,000, they will pay less tax this year than they did last year? That cannot be the right decision to take in those circumstances. A different decision would have allowed us to uh, provide that additional £5 in child benefit, to raise £30,000 of those children out of poverty. And what about this nation's future? How can it be right that we provide that tax cut? Because it is a tax cut for the wealthiest uh, in our society. Well, uh, people say because the UK took, made, made a choice to do with the allowance, but the powers we have allow us to take that away and to make sure that those who earn more pay more. That's what the powers we've got allow us to do. And that is what we should have done. Instead of producing a budget which cuts that investment in our future, cuts funding for our universities, cuts funding for our colleges, and cuts hundreds of millions of pounds uh, from the local authorities who are responsible for funding our schools. No, we will not support this abdication of responsibility, nor this lack of ambition for our nation. We will oppose this this evening. Thank you very much, Mr Gray. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Honour Officer. I am pleased to be able to speak in this important debate this afternoon on the Scottish Rates Resolution Settlement as a member of the Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee. I'd like to focus my Just points this afternoon. Just a wee minute, Ms Harper. I know we're short of time. Please don't carry on a conversation across the chamber when somebody's speaking. Ms Harper, please. Thank you. I'd like to focus my points this afternoon on income tax as well as the uncertainty Brexit has and indeed is continuing to cause for businesses and our economy. 
areas which I have participated in the analysis as part of the committee membership. And, presiding officer, as members will know, in this budget for 2019-20, uh, income tax remains partially a devolved tax, with the responsibility for defining the income tax base, including the changing or setting of income tax reliefs and exemptions, such as the personal allowance, being matters reserved to the UK Government, at whichever rate it chooses to set the bans for these areas are. However, the Scotland Act of 2016 did give the Scottish Parliament the power to set all income tax rates, as well as the thresholds of bans that apply to the non-savings, non-dividend income of Scottish taxpayers. And this, that income tax paid to HMRC by Scottish taxpayers, is then given to the Scottish Government. And I'm pleased to see a commitment from HMRC to ensure that their database of Scottish taxpayers is kept up to date and regularly checked. And I would ask the Scottish Government to ensure that this HMRC commitment is honoured. The income tax bans set out by Scottish Government ensure that middle to lower earning taxpayers, such as the majority of nurses, teachers, social workers and healthcare professionals, remain protected. And this has been delivered by an inflationary increase in the starter and basic rate bans, as well as through no changes to rates of tax. And I remind Chamber that I am a nurse, but it means that, for example, that nurses in receipt of a band 5 salary of between 22,128 and 28,746, the majority of nurses, 68% when last reported in 2016, 68% will either be on the proposed Scottish basic rate of tax, paying 20% in rates, or will be on an intermediate rate of tax, paying just 21%. Therefore, this means that nurses on a starter band 5 rate will be paying the lowest tax levels across the whole of the UK for a person on this rate of income, which is welcome and actually fair. In honouring the Government's commitment to fairness and equality across all aspects of taxation policy, while at the same time raising additional revenue to invest in public services and the economy, I'm pleased the Scottish Government has proposed a freeze of the higher rate tax thresholds, freezing the proposed higher rate threshold of £43,000, and the top rate will remain frozen at £150,000. I mention this step as it allows Scotland to remain an attractive place for business, an attractive place to grow our skilled workforce, as well as an attractive place for the higher rate earners to remain in Scotland. And in, so doing, in doing so, it allows the Scottish economy to continue to grow, particularly as we're now seeing an ageing population on the rise and the need for inward migration, particularly into our NHS and social care, and as well as our agricultural sectors. Presiding officer, attracting people to live, work and study in Scotland is crucial for our economy. And I would be wrong not to mention the impact of Brexit and its having on our Scottish rate settlement and the uncertainty it has caused for businesses and the economy. The Finance and Constitution Committee's report on the 2019-20 budget highlights the problems Brexit has caused for our economy. The report shows that since November 2016, the OBR's forecasts have reflected provisional broad brush adjustments to incorporate the possible impact of Brexit. These are notably that trade intensity, net inward migration and business investment and productivity growth would be weaker than would otherwise have been the if the case should have been that the UK voted to remain part of the EU. Indeed, the OBR told the committee that they had a forecast prior to the referendum showing that assuming there would be a vote to remain in the EU, the economy would grow by roughly 4.5% between the time of the referendum and now. That's staggering. Should the people of the rest of the UK, and I say the rest of the UK because Scotland voted to remain by 62%, if the rest of the UK had decided to have remained part of the world's most successful union and single market, we would have seen a sharp rise in our economic prosperity. But instead, we're seeing businesses leave the UK, a fall in consumer confidence and a negative impact on the economy. Therefore, in my view, reaffirming the need for Scotland to remain part of the customs union single market, as well as maintaining free movement of people for the interest and the benefit of our economy, is absolutely what we need to support. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I'd like to put on record my support for the Scottish Government's proposed budget for 2019-20, as it allows for Scottish taxpayers 
on average salaries to remain protected while also remaining the lowest taxed in the UK. This budget allows for Scotland to have some stability, particularly in the time of Brexit uncertainty, and for Scotland to remain a welcoming and attractive place for businesses, workers and families, families to come live, work and study, which is key for our economic success. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Rachel Lyle. Ms Hamilton is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The SNP have gone tax crazy. Whatever form it comes in, whether it's income tax, council tax, car parking tax, it seems that as, as we get further into this session of Parliament, they seem adamant to raid the paid pockets of hard-working Scots. Let's get the facts straight first. Promises have been broken. We know that in their 2016 manifesto, they promised not to increase taxes. Yet, one million Scots are now paying more in income tax. We see the block grant increase by 500 million, and yet the cuts keep coming. As ever, with this tired and out of touch government, it's always pay more, get less. Almost two thirds of Scots voted for parties who promised not to raise taxes, and we were one of them. That can't be said of the SNP now. I'll take an intervention from uh, Stuart McMillan. Stuart McMillan. Thank Rachel Hamilton for taking intervention. Now, would Rachel Hamilton tell the Chamber what the level of UK national debt is as compared to what it was in 2010 when the Tories came into power? Ms Hamilton. Do you know that actually what your voters will not actually support the SNP anymore after uh, Nicola Sturgeon has broken her tax promises. And that's what the SNP party need to think about, not bothering about other issues other than its rates resolution debate today. The FSB has warned against more taxes in Scotland. And Andy Wilco Wilcox is actually quoted in saying, this budget breaks new ground. It must not open the floodgates to a host of Scottish supplements, charges and levies. Now that the SNP have had to do a back of the fab packet deal with the Greens, and um, for years it will be impossible to predict the new stream of taxes. Will it ever end and how much will they increase? Let us be clear here, these new income taxes will hit hardworking families the most and also businesses. We're not talking about the bankers, we're talking about head teachers, police sergeants, senior nurses. These people treat our ill, teach our children and keep our communities safe. I haven't got time, sorry. They, nor any hard-working Scot, should have to pay more just because they live in Scotland. And anyone earning over 26,990 will pay more tax than they would in the rest of the UK. Presiding officer, as a representative of a border constituency, I'm concerned over the impact of this widening tax gap will have on my constituents. I completely disagree with what John Mason had to say earlier about the behavioural change that may happen. I'm glad that Scottish Borders Council were in, unanimous in its opposition to the tourist tax and to the car park uh, tax. Given the damage this would cause to our area, it is rich of the SNP government to ask councils after years of funding cuts to increase council tax, tax our tourists, then charge ordinary working folk to park at their workplace. Even though the borders have come out against the workplace car parking levy, some 250,000 Scots might be affected by this levy. In Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example, many of whom are my constituents commuting to work from a rural area. Patrick Harvey sits from a sedentary position talking about the numbers are not out yet. Well, where are the figures, Patrick Harvey? Patrick the, Harvey. The entire point which the centralising Conservatives don't seem to understand is that this is a power given to local authority to design a scheme that is right for their own area. And if they think it's wrong for their own area, they won't do it. What on earth is wrong with giving councils the ability to make their own choices in their own local context? Rachel Hamilton. That was a rather long intervention, Patrick Harvey, but the Conservatives do believe in empowering local authorities by devolving financial powers to councils. We support the devolution of measures that will improve accountability and drive local growth and in terms of the economy that is so important you might sit there and laugh but growing the sh and sh not shrinking the tax base is really important and surely that's something that we should have as a common goal in the borders we need to attract more businesses and industries to create jobs and if we are to see the area prosper 
we need more highly skilled and highly paid jobs to attract people to live there. Given that travel over the border to work every day, the, the tax gap, gap is detrimental to attracting the best. Would a senior teacher in Northumberland, for example, think twice about moving up the career ladder, applying to become a head teacher in Coldstream, when they could stay in the north of England and pay less income tax? When it comes to the NHS and the borders, we continue to struggle to recruit specialist staff and doctors. Our constituency has a lot to offer, but higher taxes and higher LBT may certainly be discouraging people from moving. And I am concerned that this impact will have in drawing from the pool of talent that exists across the UK. The full impact of the tax gap is yet to be realised, and it will definitely be more pronounced in the Scottish borders, where people can travel over the border for work. But what we do know is that the Scottish Fiscal Commission have said that Scotland will lose approximately £34 million over the next five years because of behavioural change. And the reality of the widening tax gap will hit hard, and Sc Scotland will suffer before it, because of it, sadly. In conclusion, Presiding officer, we on these benches cannot support the rates resolution motion. It's bad news for hardworking Scots and it's bad news for the economy. This government have broken their promises and it's Scotch, Scottish taxpayers who will pay the price. They have well and truly made it clear that if you are aspirational, you're climbing the career ladder, that Scotland is not the place for you. Repeatedly, we've seen this SNP government fail to grow and develop the Scottish economy. With the SNP presiding officer, it's always pay more, get less. Thank you. I call Richard Lyle, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Thank Lyle, you, please. Can I begin by expressing my pleasure at contributing to this debate today? A debate on an income tax rate and ultimately a holistic view of the resources that are available to the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. And that is exactly what we are doing. We're delivering for the people of Scotland, doing the day job, as some people would say. Indeed, the Scottish Government is investing in essential public services, all the while ensuring that 55% of income tax payers in Scotland pay less, tax, pay less tax than those earning the same income in the rest of the UK. A fact that those on opposition benches do not like. Just like Brexit, the Conservatives opposite enjoy a political hokey-cokey. They're in and then they're out. Our budget deal means providing additional funding, flexibility of up to £187 million next year to local authorities, including an additional funding of £90 million to local authority core revenue grants. We have also raised the cap on council tax increases by inflation to 4.79%, whilst keeping it below the 5% in the UK and maintaining Scotland's place as the lowest tax part of the UK. Has anyone checked? What has been charged? No, I've, I've no time. It's, it's been charged in some English councils recently. Go and check it. That being said, the Scottish Government has been encouraging local authorities to take account of household budgets and remain at a flat 3%. No, I wouldn't. It enables local authorities to offset 2.2% of the contribution to adult social services in the coming year to help them manage their budgets while project, protecting the 160 million of investment from the Scottish Government. That means, in total, if local authorities use their full tax powers, local authorities will have £620 million more in the next financial year. President officer, I wish to turn to our hard-working public sector staff, such as our police and NHS workers, who have paid more and are better off as a result of the tax and spending decisions made in Scotland. A host of public sector posts in Scotland will earn more than the equivalents elsewhere in the UK after the SNP tax proposals for 2019-2020 take effect. Thanks to the higher salaries for public service for workers such as the police and NHS workers in Scotland. In fact, a hospital porter at the top of the band to NHS pay scale will be £634 a year better off compared with their English counterparts. A staff nurse at the bottom of band five will be £208 better off than their English counterparts. A paramedic on band six pay scale will be £571 better off in Scotland than in England. A police constable at the top of their pay scale will be over £1,200 better off in Scotland than in England. So when the Tories would prefer to offer tax breaks to their highest earners, the SNP are committed to creating a more progressive, prosperous and equal society for everyone. I have to say, I agree with that. that Presiding officer, no, I had to listen 
to, to absolute rubbish comments by people, and I'm going to come back at them with what I believe is the truth. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is predicting lower and middle earning taxpayers and making the tax system fairer and more progressive, taking a different approach to the rest of the UK. The Scottish Government will ensure the Scottish tax is more progressive, supports additional investment in our public services, invest in our public services that allow us to continue to deliver increasing spending in the NHS beyond that other parts of the UK. Businesses benefiting from our investment in infrastructure, broadband, research, development, business rates, support, investment in skills and training, and of course our social contract, including childcare, personal care, tuition fees, remember uh, Rachel Hamilton, tuition fees abolished, prescriptions uh, fees abolished, exceeds what's it provided elsewhere in Scotland and ensures taxpayers in Scotland have the best deal in Scotland. I think overall taxpayers get a better deal from this government than what they do for other governments in, this, in these islands. Yeah. This, of course, is all whilst this SNP government faced continual austerity measures from Westminster, which has seen Scotland's discretionary resource grant since 2010 being reduced by 6.5%, or £2 billion lower in real terms. I wonder where the Tories get the figures for. I really do. And while Scotland's discretionary resource budget allocation will be reduced by 6.5%, almost £2 billion lower, that's the real facts, not the fantasy that some of these parties live in. And that really angers me. Of course, the Tories will try to point out in 2019-20 discretionary resource block grant increases in real terms. However, after removing the uplift in health funding, we realise that actually the 2019-20 fiscal resource budget allocation is lower. It's lower in real terms in 2018-19. Once again, you're fooling no one. Indeed, our own budget process this year is set against a backdrop a Westminster system which crumbles before your eyes. Further into chaos. Your UK government ceasing to function. Scottish government doing well. Can I say to the Cabinet Secretary and to the excellent Minister in front of me, I think you've done a good job. Continue to do so and I will support you continually. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Lyle. I call Naleen Smith to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Ms Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And in closing for Labour, can I start by reminding <laughs> the Chamber, as Ian Gray did as well, that it was Labour that delivered this Scottish Parliament over 20 years ago. And I recall at that time that the SNP said Labour couldn't deliver a pizza, never mind a Parliament. Well, they were wrong. Just like they're wrong today to propose a rates resolution that's going to increased wealth inequality in Scotland. We know that the gap between rich and poor continues to increase. A rates resolution that's regressive with those earning 43,430 paying the same levels of income tax as those earning up to three times that amount. And a rates resolution that's going to leave councils struggling to deliver statutory services and having to cut other essential provision like music tuition, swimming pools and libraries. And in terms of cuts, um, the council tax rises are, of course, included in the government's budget presentation. However, if Labour councils raise the council tax by the 4.8% that Richard Lyle just mentioned to try and reduce the cuts, then no doubt Derek Mackay is going to say he only recommended 3%. But if they only increase it by 3%, then no doubt he's going to say his cuts can't be that bad if Labour councils didn't use their full council tax powers. Well, presiding officer, I think Derek Mackay could and should use his fiscal levers to stop the cuts, but instead what he's doing is forcing councils to make difficult decisions and then he's calling it empowerment. Orwell's doublethink and newspeak could have been written for Derek Mackay. Of course, there's still time to change this budget and the SNP could be made, I will in a moment, and the SNP could be made to change the budget if the Greens were to take the principled position of voting against this rates resolution tonight, abstaining on a vote on a regressive taxation proposal is highly principled, and I'll take the Minister. Minister. I thank the, the Labour Party have had the last few months to engage and negotiate and potentially change the budget, as she claims mm. she can do tonight. What would Labour's proposals be for the higher rate tax? Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the member for the intervention. The Labour Party did engage, as Derek Mackay well knows. James Kelly did 
engage. But unfortunately, Derek Mackay was not listening. We have been consistent in saying that we would reintroduce the 50 pence top tax rate taken away by the Tories. We are consistent in that. It was in the SNP manifesto, can I remind the member? President Officer, Scotland's first First Minister, the late Donald Dewar, when he was delivering the Scotland Bill, pointed to the first sentence, there shall be a Scottish Parliament, and mem memorably said, I like that. Donald Dewar was also attributed with pointing out that devolution was a process, not an event, clearly not an end in itself, and so it has been. More and more powers devolved, making this one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. And of course, as Ian Gray also noted, we started out with tax varying powers in the Scottish Parliament. That was the second question for those that are old enough to remember in the vote in 1997. But we shouldn't forget either that John Swinney, as Finance Secretary, secretly gave up that power in 2007. That was a power specifically and democratically voted for by the people of Scotland. So, Presiding Officer, it was certainly a historic year in 2017 when this Scottish Parliament then regained powers over tax and set the rates and bans for the first time. But of course that went off with a whimper rather than a bang when those new powers were not used fully to stop the cuts and challenge Tory austerity. And perhaps the members on the front bench would like to listen to these points. Last year, the SNP were neither bold nor ambitious with their rates resolution. And once again, we witnessed a cuts budget. And here we are again, building on accumulated cuts. These are tax plans that give, I don't think I have time to give an intervention, I've already given one to the Minister. These are tax plans that give a tax cut to the rich and they inflict cuts to our communities of 230 million. Labour would ask the richest to pay their fair share and to invest in our public services, but Derek Mackay said no to that, Minister, to answer your question of earlier. This resolution also shows up a budget that does nothing to tackle child poverty right here, right now. Labour asked Derek Mackay for £5 per child per week, top up to child benefit, and churches, trade unions, poverty academics and charities all agreed that that would make a huge difference. But when we asked again, Derek Mackay said no. And despite the rhetoric around the shocking Tory two-child policy and rape clause, when it comes to taking action to mitigate it, once again, Derek Mackay said no. Yes, indeed he did. He said no when he was asked to do that. No wonder the public are wondering what the SNP priorities actually are. Of course, presiding officer, overall, this has been a predictable debate. The Tories will never want to fairly tax the rich. They prefer to attack the poor with their shocking two-child policy and their utterly discredited universal credit. And the Greens who talk about fair tax, but tonight, of course, they intend to abstain and then justify their support for an SNP budget that cuts local government beyond the bone. And <clears throat> Patrick Harvey intervened in me, but I don't see that his parking at work scheme has been fully costed by the Greens. And judging by Mike Rumble's comments earlier, the Liberals are not too keen to fairly tax the rich either. The SNP in opposition at Westminster call for the reinstatement of the 50p tax rate removed by George Osborne. But here, when they're the government and they have the power, they refuse to tax the rich. Instead, they prefer to preside over cuts to jobs and services in local government, services that are needed by the poorest and most vulnerable in society. I can't take an intervention. Members just closing. closing. The SNP argue that Westminster holds all the power, but in reality, this government has the devolved power to change our income tax brackets, to ensure a more progressive and fairer tax system, to tackle child poverty immediately, and to stop the vicious cuts to local government. Scottish Labour presiding officer stands for the many, not the few, and we will not support this timid tax proposal that simply passes on turbocharged Tory austerity to our councils and sees poverty continue. Cuts to councils or cuts to communities. The SNP tax policy and cuts budget has been influenced by the Tories, it's been aided and abetted by the Greens, and it will not be supported by Labour. Thank you very much. And I call on Dean Lockhart, close to the Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Mr Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me start with some consensus and agree with something the Finance Secretary said during Stage 1 of the Budget debate. When I asked him how he would deal with massive uh, cuts to public spending in an independent Scotland, Derek Mackay told the Chamber that the priority must be to grow the economy. Not increase tax, but to grow the economy. For once, I agree with Derek Mackay. I'm glad he has finally come round to our side of the argument that the only sustainable way to deliver increased public spending in Scotland is by growing the economy, yeah. not increasing the yeah. tax burden on hard-working families. Yeah, I will yeah. in a second. 
But that's exactly what today's rate resolution does. It increases the tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK. It will further damage an already stagnating economy. And that's why we will be voting against the rate resolution at decision time. I'll give way. Minister. Brexit and immigration policy is going to help grow the economy or not? Dean Lockhart. Well, it's interesting uh, the Minister runs to, to Brexit as an excuse for the SNP over the last 11 years failing to grow the economy. Yeah, exactly. You've had 11 years to grow the economy and you've failed miserably. Presiding officer, uh, a wide range of issues were raised during the debate this afternoon. Let me pick up on uh, three of those issues. First of all, the growing list of broken promises when it comes to SNP tax policy. Murdo Fraser and Rachel Hamilton reminded everyone that this is an SNP government elected on a clear manifesto promise not to increase the basic rate of income tax. The wording for the SNP Holyrood manifesto could not have been clearer. We will freeze the basic rate of income tax throughout the next parliament to protect those on low and middle incomes. The Deputy First Minister was even more explicit when he told this chamber I want to say to teachers and public service workers that the last thing that I'm going to do is put up their taxes. But here we are now, over a million workers in Scotland paying more income tax as a result of that broken manifesto pledge. And those SNP broken promises don't end there. This is an SNP government which has also promised not to raise the cap on council tax. But thanks to the SNP once again caving in to the Greens, low-income households are now facing council tax hikes of almost 5%. And this could mean an increase of £500 a year in tax bills. And Willie Rennie, in his contribution, listed a number of other broken promises from the SNP, including the tourist tax and the plastic bag tax. Now, in her opening remarks, Kate Forbes claimed that the SNP's tax policies are fair and progressive. We also heard the SNP's standard line that the Scottish Conservatives want tax cuts for the rich. But as always, once you look beyond the SNP spin, the facts tell us something very different. It's the UK government, the UK Conservative government, which has delivered tax cuts for more than 2.4 million lower paid workers by increasing the personal tax threshold. I, I need to make some progress by increasing the personal tax threshold every year since it was elected. In contrast, it's the SNP who have increased income tax for low and middle earners. Everyone earning more than £27,000 will pay more tax in Scotland as a result of the SNP broken promise. It's also the SNP who are introducing the new car parking tax, which could cost up to £500 a year. A regressive tax, not one based on the ability to pay and one that will hit the lowest earners yeah. the hardest. It's no wonder the people of Scotland are now asking, where's the fairness in that? It's an SNP government that is out of touch. Instead of increasing the tax burden on lower and middle earners, it's time the Finance Secretary recognised that the real priority should be to expand the tax base in Scotland. This need to expand the tax base is clearly highlighted by the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR. Their most recent forecasts show two things. Scotland has a lower pro rata number of higher and additional rate taxpayers compared to the rest of the UK and that income tax revenues for the UK as a whole are forecast to grow significantly more than income tax receipts in Scotland. These forecasts paint a grim fiscal outlook and will only mean one thing, less money being available for public spending in Scotland. Presiding officer, the answer to this fiscal challenge is not to increase the tax burden on the diminishing tax base in Scotland. The answer is to expand the tax base in Scotland by growing the economy and attracting more higher paid workers to Scotland. The Finance Committee has heard evidence that attracting an extra 2,000 additional tax rate uh, taxpayers would give the Scottish Government an extra £100 million a year annually to spend on public services. And that's why the Scottish Chamber of Commerce have told the SNP, and I quote, the sooner our politicians realise that supporting economic growth rather than hiking up taxes is the route towards increasing revenues and improving investment in services, the quicker Scotland will prosper. We agree with that. The final issue, presenting officer, I want to touch on is the size of the Scottish budget. We have heard again from the SNP the standard line that UK funding to Scotland has been cut. That's simply not the case. According to Spice and the Fraser of Allender, the overall budget from the UK government is increasing not just in this financial year, but the overall budget has increased since the Conservatives came to power in 2010. In fact, the only reason the tax burden has to increase in Scotland now 
is because the additional billion pounds uh, increase in funding coming from the UK government is being offset by a £500 million decline in tax revenues here in Scotland as a result of the SNP's failure to grow the economy. And it's now the reality and the consequence of that is it's now the hardworking people of Scotland who will have to pay the consequences of the SNP's economic incompetence over the past 11 years. That's not fair, that's not progressive, and that's why we will be voting against the rate resolution at decision time. Thank you very much. I now call Kate Forbes to close the government. Minister, please, till decision time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If you were playing budget bingo, you'd have had a full house pretty early on in this debate with the usual rhetoric from the opposition parties. The Tories often talk about making this country an attractive place for people to work, live and invest in. And I happen to agree quite wholeheartedly with that. The irony, of course, being that they have not just made the UK an even less attractive country, but are now actively preventing people from moving here with their anti-immigration policies. Dean Lockhart rightly talks about expanding the tax base. The CBI, FSB and many others have condemned the Tories' immigration proposals as being catastrophic for the economy, with one saying that the UK government seems hell-bent on ignoring the business community. And that's, of course, consistent with the SFC's analysis, who, which is clear that Brexit is a key factor in the subdued outlook and, critically, and that was the other part of my question to Dean Lockhart, slow population growth which is being utterly exacerbated by the Tories' failed immigration policies of the past and current proposals. When it comes to income tax, the Tories know that there is no appetite for a further £500 million cut to our public services, which their tax policies would cause. And that's not just Scottish Government analysis. Other independent forecasters, including the Fraser Allender Institute, have produced analysis which supports those claims. With pleasure. Mike Rumbles. Information whether having the government taken the deliberate decision not to raise the threshold for the 41 pence taxpayers in line with inflation, could you tell us how many Scottish taxpayers are now brought into that higher level simply because they ha you haven't raised the threshold with inflation? Minister. Well, our commitment in this um, budget, which I made clear in my opening speech, is that we want certainty for taxpayers. So that is why we have not raised the rates and that's why we have frozen the threshold. However, we do want to protect lower and middle earning taxpayers and that is why we have increased the threshold to protect them. Because, presiding officer, we value Scotland's unique social contract, which is attractive and we want to make this country attractive we have provided we have defended and we have extended core universal services rights and benefits our commitment for example to free tuition to 600 hours of free early learning and childcare, which will increase um, to over a thousand hours free school meals for all primary one to primary three year olds free personal care, the abolition of prescription charges, nationally concessionary travel schemes for older and disabled people. And in this year's budget, contrary to Ian Gray's accusation, we have increased spend on colleges' resource budgets. We have increased the health resource. And the total core funding package for local government is £11.2 <coughs> billion. Pounds. Presiding officer, yep. Ian Gray. Will she accept, however, that college budgets, resource and capital have been slashed? Minister. What I would accept, and it's quite clear in this year's budget, is that their resource spend has increased, and that's why it was incorrect to say that the resource um, budget has declined. Presiding officer, when it comes to the economy, stats out today show that whilst we will continue to invest our econ in the economy, it is resilient. We see that unemployment rates for Scotland's women and young people are at record lows. Youth employment rates are higher than the UK rate. Female employment rates are higher than the UK rate. Unemployment in Scotland has fallen to 3.5%, which is the lowest on record. And Scotland's employment rate rose again to 75.5%. All that, as the CBI claimed in January, in light of um, fears that a no-deal Brexit would cost the Scottish economy £14 billion a year by 2034. They claimed that that was more... They they claimed that that was more, Dean Lockhart might want to listen to this first and then I'll take his intervention, that was more than the annual public spending on hospitals, GP services and other health services. But will the Tories take the threat of a no deal off the table? 
I don't know. Perhaps Dean Lockhart can answer that. Dean Lockhart. The Minister mentioned the labour market statistics out today, which show inactivity levels in Scotland higher than the rest of the UK. Can you explain why inactivity levels are higher? Minister. Well, unemployment rates are moving in the right direction. We are aware, as I said in my opening to that point, that we are not taking our eyes off the ball. We are aware that if we are facing challenges now, those are only going to be exacerbated over the course of the next few years, over the course of the next few months alone. And so we will continue to target our investment, to support people into work, and to ensure that we are tackling the key issues of poverty. Presiding officer, we are nevertheless, after this debate, none the wiser of about Labour's tax policies. They don't know how much tax they'd have to raise to fund their additional requests. All whilst the Shadow Chancellor said um, a number of months ago that he wouldn't reverse the Tories' tax gift to the rich. And the Lib Dems seemed to claim credit as the architects of the SNP's income tax policies, but will vote against it tonight, jeopardising £11.5 billion of investment in all the things that they profess to care for. The party of apparent localism, until, of course, the SNP tries to devolve powers to local authorities. All parties, incidentally, appear to be localist when it comes to local authority elections. Even the Tories, who I understand, apparently voted for the principle of pursuing consent yeah. to introduce yeah. a workplace parking levy in August at Edinburgh City Council last year. But back to the rates resolution before us, presiding officer. Our income tax policy is forecast to raise over £11.5 billion to support the best outcomes for Scotland's people and for Scotland's economy. The opposition, with one exception, would prefer chaos and uncertainty than the certainty of revenue for our precious public services. And to put that £11.5 billion in perspective, that is approximately the total core funding package for local authorities. Tonight is our opportunity to use the powers of this parliament to build a fairer, more prosperous country. Our income tax policy is key to delivering that. We have reversed UK government's, the UK government's continued pursuit of budget cuts. Our income tax policy proposal freezes all rates, increases the starter and intermediate rate bans by inflation and freezes the higher and top rate thresholds. That ensures that 55% of Scottish taxpayers continue to pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK. And Scotland will continue to be the fairest and the lowest yeah. tax part of the UK. We will not pass on UK government tax cuts for higher earners. Our tax proposals protect those on low incomes. They make the tax system fairer and more progressive and they will raise an extra £68 million to invest in public services to tackle poverty and to support Scotland's economy. I'll take an intervention. Mardu Fraser. I'm very grateful to, to Kate Forbes for giving way. On the issue of protecting those on low pay, does she not accept that the proposed workplace parking levy will be a regressive tax which will hit hardest on those who are lowest paid? Is that not the case? Before you answer, Minister, can I ask members to keep their chatter down as it's building and I cannot hear the Minister? Minister. What I do accept is the whole concept of empowering and ensuring that local authorities have the powers that they need. And in conversations with local authorities, they are clear that they want to be able to make local decisions about local assets that serve local interests. And as a government, we are committed to making sure that that includes tax powers as well. I'm very mindful I've got a minute and a half, but go for it. James Kelly. It's just really a point of clarification, just looking at the actual rate motion uh, in front of us, the higher rate of 41% uh, has been set between 30,930 up to 150,000. Uh, and that's not what was proposed in the draft budget. It was 43,430 to 150,000. So, you know, I'm just mentioning that in terms of accuracy. Minister. Proposed um, as in the budget, and apparently it's a technicality in terms of the legislation to be consistent with the legislation. So back to the, the substance of the debate today, we will be delivering an additional £182 million in revenue against the associated block grant adjustment. Our budget delivers an NHS that is well funded. 
Families will have access to free childcare. Students will have access to free tuition. There will be no prescription fees, and we will ensure that our older generation can benefit from free personal care. That is all delivered by sound, certain, and evidence-based tax policies. And our income tax proposals in the rate resolution before us today, alongside the spending plans for 2019-20, will ensure that Scotland is an attractive place to live work and to raise a family. Thank you very much. And now that concludes our debate on the Scottish Rate uh, Resolution. And uh, we're going to go straight, the way that uh, standing orders works, we're going to actually go straight to the vote, although it's not quite decision time, we're going to go straight to the vote on this issue. Uh, and before I put the question, I would advise uh, members that under Rule 9.16.7, Stage 3 proceedings on the Budget Scotland Number 3 Bill cannot begin unless the Scottish Rate Resolution is agreed to. So the question is that Motion 15879, in the name of Derek Mackay, on the Scottish Rate Resolution is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15879 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 61, no, 52. There were six abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. Now, as the uh, Scottish rate resolution has been agreed, the Budget Scotland number three bill can now proceed to stage three and stage three proceedings will take place on Thursday. Members will also recall that the Commission on Parliamentary Reform proposed that time be set aside during meetings for announcements from committees. And in that context, I'm pleased to call Bob Doris, convener of the Social Security Committee, to make an announcement on social security support for housing. Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As convener of the Social Security Committee, I announce today that we have launched an inquiry into social security support for housing. We want to explore how changes to the social security system are impacting both tenants and on landlords. It is not just the most vulnerable people in our society who can find themselves in difficulty because the rising gap between housing rents and the amount provided by the social security system, but also those in work. We know there are pressures on social housing stock. An area which we should be able to ease this would be the private rented sector. As part of this inquiry, we will look at the extent to which social security systems assists or hinders those in need of private rented accommodation in Scotland. In February last year, the, government, the Local Government Committee explored some of these issues around welfare reform, and in the report on homelessness, it said by Shelter that the rollout of welfare reform and universal credit were creating a complicated landscape to navigate. This committee will explore in more detail some of the impacts of these welfare reforms as they relate to housing, including universal credit and the local housing allowance and to our newly devolved powers and how they can contribute to that discussion also. To inform our views, we are engaging with stakeholders, organisations and people with lived experience to answer five key questions. How have changes to local housing allowance impacted on the private rented sector, particularly for affordability of rents for young people? To what extent have UK welfare reform measures impacted on private landlords' willingness to let those in receipt to let to those in receipt of social security benefits? How does the administration of universal credit housing costs impact on the ability of tenants to pay their rent and landlords to administer rent payments? Fourthly, how does universal credit, Scottish choices and discretionary housing payments impact 
in the way landlords and tenants handle universal credit housing costs. And in relation to all those four questions, what improvements could be made to reserved and devolved systems, including the way they interact with each other? Our committee presiding officer would welcome MSP sharing details of our inquiry with interested stakeholders, constituents and networks they feel would have a valuable input, particularly those with lived experience. And, presiding officer, thank you for the opportunity to address this most important inquiry at the uh, Chamber this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Doris. And that brings us to decision time, but there are no decisions to be taken at decision time today. So, I ask members who are leaving to leave quietly as we move on to members' business. In the name of James Kelly, on the threatened closure of the St Rollicks Railway Works. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the ministers to change seats.